All right. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. So I got to say uh, that I am sort of sad that this is our last lecture, but uh, I have an idea we'll do something like this again sometime, so I'm already kind of looking forward to, all right, what can this look like down the road in the future? But I want to say thank you for being here tonight. Now tonight, uh, the title of the lecture is The Bible as a Whole and Its Parts. And so this is our fourth lecture. Let me ask, out of curiosity, raise your hand if you have actually endured all of these lectures. All right, you have another jewel on your crown in heaven. <laughs> Maybe it's four, one, one for each lecture that you attended. Uh, I got to say this, um, I think the best way for me to put this is I really admire how much you guys have seemed to enthusiastically embrace the opportunity to come and just think through these kinds of things together. You're taking time out of your schedule, and I know that they are busy schedules. I get that. Uh, but I, I've told people I really admire the hunger that the people of our church have shown. Uh, and so um, I really appreciate that. And I've had a really, really good time. I am looking forward to tonight maybe... Maybe the most of any of the lectures, uh, I am going to have a lot of fun tonight. I hope you will also have fun. I am going to have a ton of fun. Before we get into it, though, I, I would like to mention a couple things if uh, you are interested in any resources. So last week, I believe it was, Kathy asked me what kind of commentaries I would recommend. And I tried to basically explain that's a very difficult question for me to ask with a whole group listening because I would want to take things case by case. But I did think I should have at least mentioned the book that I gave away. I believe it was our first week. Brandon, you got the Holman, the concise Holman commentary. Uh, I would recommend that one. So if you don't have any commentaries at all, and you're interested after having gone through some of these, hey, what kind of resources might I have? I would recommend the Holman concise Bible commentary edited by David Dockery. Uh, and you can always email me for lots of other suggestions, and we can get coffee, and we can talk books together, uh, and we're going to give away something as well that I would also recommend, a study Bible. So if you don't have a good study Bible, and you want some sort of a resource, that would be a great way to get going. And then if you want to start to spend hundreds and thousands of dollars, then we can really talk, and I can give you some really, really good ideas, and uh, maybe even just become really good friends with you, and all that. So uh, so I wanted to mention that as far as resources. I also would like to share a few names of preachers that approach Scripture uh, in a way that I really admire, in a way that I try to, in a way that I'm trying to present in all these lectures. So let me give you some names. If you are one of those who enjoy listening to podcasts or you watch videos of preachers, uh, and we have lots of famous ones uh, out there, let me let me offer some that I would recommend. I, I don't really have time to listen to a lot of sermons, which is the whole irony of the last seven years of my life, getting a school degree in preaching. I listen to actually very little outside of preaching because I've been doing so much reading about it. But if you've never heard David Platt preach, I would recommend him, David Platt, P-L-A-T-T. Uh, he is uh, the pastor of McLean Bible Church. That's M-C-L-E-A-N. It looks like McLean. McLean Bible Church up in the D.C. area, uh, and he is pretty much the top of my list of pastors and preachers that I admire, that I enjoy listening to. My wife and I actually attended, and Noah, uh, attended his church in Birmingham for a while, back several years ago, uh, and so he's amazing. David Platt, a guy named Jim Shaddix, S-H-A-D-D-I-X, he is my professor, my major professor advisor in school, and he does a lot of interim preaching. I believe he's still pastoring interim, uh, a church in the Jackson, Mississippi area. And so you could probably just Google his name, find a bunch of sermons. Uh, I certainly would recommend him. Uh, many of you may know the name Matt Chandler. I would recommend him. He's the pastor of the Village Church in the Dallas area. Matt Chandler, in my opinion, is probably... Uh, the easiest preacher to listen to. He has just the most engaging delivery, in my opinion. So he's just a phenomenal uh, preacher. And one other, 
would be a guy named Kenan Vaughn, K-E-N-N-O-N. I don't remember if his last name is spelled V-A-U-G-H-N or if there's an A-N in there. Uh, but Kenan Vaughn is the pastor of Harvest Church Memphis, which is the church that my family most recently attended before we moved here. Uh, and I uh, consider him a fantastic preacher, Kenneth Vaughn. So those are four names. There's, there's probably 20 others that we could talk about, but uh, I certainly want to take the opportunity to just give you guys some others to look. Oh, Tony Marita. I, I better mention him too. He is also a professor I've had in school. Uh, M-E-R-I-D-A, Tony Marita. He pastors Imago Day Church up in uh, the Raleigh, North Carolina area, Wake Forest area. Uh, so those are guys that if you are a podcast junkie, um, I would encourage you to listen to them. I had someone approach me the other day, says she's been listening to Robert Smith Jr. videos, so don't forget I also mentioned him, um, but those are resources. If we can get our people listening to preaching like that, I'm going to consider that a win. Uh, that is absolutely fantastic. So with that being said, let me go ahead and say a prayer, and then we are going to start talking about the Bible as a whole and the Bible in its parts. Let's pray. Uh, God, I, th I thank you again um, for the fourth time that you have allowed us to gather here to spend some focused time, um, maybe away from sort of the hustle of all the, the regular Sunday scheduling that goes on. Uh, thank you for giving us a chance to focus, take a deep breath together, uh, again, as we are reminded, the idea of just sort of being still around the embers of your word. Uh, and uh, even though we're in a crowd right now, so to speak, that we can have an intimate conversation as brothers and sisters in Christ, listening to you through your word, uh, being fed. Hopefully we are inspired and enlightened uh, according to the scriptures tonight. So God, I ask that you would do something powerful tonight, that you would work among us. I thank you for the ways that I've had several people share over the last few weeks, uh, it, just the ways that God seems to be either increasing their appetite for your word or just should, uh, shedding new light. Lord, that's what we want to happen all the time. And so we thank you for that. So we already celebrate that you have accomplished your will through the Ember Lectures, and I certainly pray that tonight uh, would bear the same kind of fruit and so we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so hopefully you've got your outline. And uh, the first thing I want us to talk about, I want us to think about the Bible as one book. All right, I want us to think about the Bible as one book. And I will say, I think that maybe this is not how we tend to view it, which is understandable. Because as soon as I say the Bible's one book, there's the understandable question that could be, well, are there not 66 books in the Bible? The answer is yes. We, we refer to this uh, as a collection of 66 books. Obviously, some of these books are very, very short. We wish that we were assigned books that length in high school and college. Uh, but there are 66 books in the Bible. They were written over some 1,500 years um, many authors, human authors, have been used to put this together, just like we talked about the first night. But it is still one book. And so I want us to talk about that. What I want you to do is I want you to think of a question. I don't want you to come up with answers. I just want you to mull this over. Uh, why is it important that the Bible is one book? Why is this aspect of the Bible important? All right, so I just want you to be mulling that over. I want to go ahead and do some giveaways if you guys are ready to receive free stuff. So we will go ahead and pull a yellow tag out to give away another copy of Gospel-Centered Teaching. David Fitzgerald. All right, everybody give David a round of applause. I'll walk this over to you. I need to get more steps in anyway. All right, thank you for being here. All right, now I told y'all this morning, if you're here at church, we are getting into the power tools, okay? Now I consider books tools. They're not trophies, they're tools. They're kind of toys also, but they are tools. Now these are power tools. So let me, let me say a few words about this first one. This book here, uh, the title of it is called Invitation to Biblical Interpretation. Now that's not tantalizing enough. You've got to hear the subtitle. 
the subtitle is Exploring the Hermeneutical Triad of History, Literature, and Theology. Okay, exactly. Amen. This is called Revival, everybody. This is 849 pages of hermeneutical treasure right here. Now, let me just say, I would not recommend that you start tonight, flip to the first page, and just start reading through, which is basically kind of how I had to do it. Uh, you can do it that way, but this is, this is a reference tool. All right, so whoever wins this, I hope that what you'll find is that this will sit on your shelf for years, and you will use it. And when you're studying uh, the prophets, you might come pull this out, read a little bit more, sort of get dusted off your knowledge on the prophets. And then when you're reading New Testament stuff and you go into that. So think of it as a reference tool. Uh, this, uh, this book is written by two authors, Andreas Kostenberger. I had him for class uh, my first year uh, at Southeastern, and Richard Patterson. So anyway, we are in the power tools. This would be kind of like, um, uh, like an uh, air compressor, you know, kind of one of those heavy-duty tools. And so this is going to belong in the library of Rebecca Ward. All right. I expect the full report next week. All right, fantastic, man. We, I should have doubled the amount of giveaways because it's just fun giving stuff away, but that's all right. We'll have to just do this again. Okay, so I've asked you to mull something over. Why is it important that we can consider the Bible one book? Let me just start to answer it. Now, let me go ahead and warn you. We are going to spend some time on this aspect, so I hope you'll find it as fun as I do. The Bible's unity is an essential aspect of its nature. We need to understand that the Bible is a unified book. So if we go back to the first week, the very first thing we talked about is that the Bible is written by human authors and a divine author. The divine author is inspiring the human authors and the unity of the Bible reflects the nature of its divine author, God. God doesn't contradict himself. He's not confused. He is consistent. He's true to his nature and his character. And so we can trust that as he has inspired all of Scripture, then Scripture has a unity to it. And I got to say, I, I feel like I went years without being able to understand the Bible's unity, and therefore without being able to enjoy it and benefit from it and utilize it. And so what I want to do is I want us to spend quite some time right now, and I want to give you some highlights of the Bible's unity. I want you to think of the word meta-narrative, okay, the overall storyline. The Bible is one book, and it tells us this wonderful story from beginning to end, it is different than the kind of novel that you and I might read that's a New York bestseller, but it is still one book. And so what I want to do is invite you to go on a bit of a tour with me through some of the highlights of the Bible's narratives. And you'll see in your outline that I've got some of these references in bold. And I want you to see some seams. There are seams throughout Scripture, and I'm, I may be not hitting on all of them, but I'm going to hit on enough of them to show you it's actually pretty intriguing the way that the Holy Spirit has kind of helped form the shape of the Scripture. So, so we begin in Genesis 1 and 2. Now, let me go ahead and say this. If you, if you do not enjoy, and I, I mean this sincerely, some people don't like having to flip through a bunch of passages of Scripture over and over. That's fine. Just listen, soak this in. If you want to, go ahead. We're not going to touch base on all of these. I'm especially planning on hitting uh, the seams but a lot of these you'll know about. But anyway, with that being said, just kind of come along with me on this tour. In Genesis 1 and 2, uh, you're probably very familiar with what takes place. God creates the heavens and the earth. And Genesis 1 shows us this orderly creation. Genesis 2 shows us how uh, man and woman are created, this very intimate picture. And then Genesis 3 happens. And in Genesis 3 through 11, you can kind of group these chapters together together. This is where it all goes haywire. 
In Genesis 1 and 2, God can look at creation and say, it's a good, it's good, it's good. Then he looks at humans that he created, male and female, in his image. He says, it's very good. And Adam and Eve have this amazing relationship with God where they are able to walk with him and talk with him and just enjoy fellowship with him and with one another. And then it all goes haywire because in chapter 3, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he approaches the woman and he says, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And notice what he's doing. He is challenging what? The word of God. Did God say this? In other words, he is already calling into question the word of God. So if anything, kind of let that form the backdrop of the significance of us getting together on a night like tonight just to talk about the Word of God. Because we have an enemy who wants to question that and twist it and challenge us with it. And so he talks, at, I almost said Mary, he talks Eve into eating the fruit and then it all goes absolutely haywire. And later on down the road as we look at different aspects, we're to come back to Genesis 3 for just a moment. But Genesis 3 through 11, you could basically summarize it as the world just becoming one big mess. Okay, they fall into sin in chapter 3. Murder takes place in chapter 4. Chapters 5 and so forth are the story of the flood with Noah. And then chapter 11, you have this story where the, the nations of the earth speak the same language. And in their pride, they want to build a tower that will take them up to heaven. All right, they've got this prideful stance. And God comes down and he confuses their language and then they scatter across the world, which is what they were supposed to do in the first place. He told humans to multiply and fill the earth, and so he's going to get his will accomplished one way or the other. And so Genesis 11, the world is an absolute atrocity. It is a complete and utter mess. And if you ended the story of the Bible there, it would look like absolute abject failure. And yet, in chapter 12, God begins to do something. In Genesis chapter 12, in a very real way, you start to see redemptive history get ushered into the narrative. And he approaches a man named Abram, and he calls him to go from where he was living and to go where he was going to show him. And so he calls Abram, and he tells him that he's going to bless Abram, and he's going to make nations out of him. And we're going to revisit this call here in just a little while. And so we're going to cruise over that. So he calls Abram, and then Abram has Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob. This is all in the book of Genesis. And then Jacob has 12 sons. And the book of Genesis ends by focusing on which son? Joseph. Yeah, so it ends, Genesis 37 through 50 is, is the story of Joseph. So you have this meta-narrative, this overall Bible story, and then you have all these little episodes, for lack of a better way to put it, and there's this episode on Joseph. And I want you to see how the book of Genesis ends with the death of Joseph. So turn to Genesis 50. Now this is one of the themes that I want you to see. In Genesis 50, I want you to begin, just kind of follow along in verse 22. And if you don't know the story of Joseph very well, let me just summarize it, that he, he was sold into slavery by his own brothers, taken into Egypt, framed, imprisoned, uh, endured a lot of suffering there, but eventually by God's grace, who never left him, he was exalted to the second place in the, uh, the empire of Egypt and became very important to help keep people alive during a famine. And then eventually he uh, had his family come back and reunited with his brothers. A very powerful story. And so he is now dead at this point. And in Genesis 50, verse 22, it says, So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years, and Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. 
Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Now, that's the end of the book of Exodus, or Genesis. I just want you to read now, right in the next page, the beginning of Exodus. And I want you to see how there's this smooth seam. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt from Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died. So we just read about. Then Joseph died and all his brothers and all the generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And so off we go into the story of Exodus. So the main thing I want you to see is you see how there's a smooth scene between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus. They connect. All right, God has designed his word in this way. And so you go on to the story of Exodus. And I would imagine most of us know very well the story of Moses being used uh, to uh, rescue God's people out of Egypt. All right, they were enslaved for 400 years in Egypt. All right, so like generations have come and gone. Moses is called. And then in Exodus 13 and 14, they are able to flee I want to read one verse for you, so if you're following along, uh, find chapter 13, verse 19. All right, this is, as they're leaving, like the pillar of cloud and fire is leading them, they are about to cross the Red Sea, and Exodus 13, verse 19 says, Moses took, what? The bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And so we see that the story is continuing. And the people are rescued out of Egypt. And uh, they meet God who gives them uh, the law. And they act like complete knuckleheads and start worshiping a cow because that makes sense. And, and then God gives them a second chance. And God ends up talking to them about what the tabernacle is to look like. So God has rescued these people out. They are his people. He has chosen them. And he wants to have a relationship with them. And one of the means by which they can relate with him is through the tabernacle where his, where his presence will dwell. And so a big part of Exodus shows the design of the tabernacle. And I want you to come to Exodus 40 with me uh, if you are walking along the tour. In Exodus 40, the tabernacle has been built. It is also referred to as the tent of meeting. So in Exodus 40, I'm going to begin reading in verse 32. So let's just read the end of the book of Exodus. When they went into the tent of meeting, and when they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded Moses... And he erected the court around the temple and the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. That's finished the work of designing and setting up the tabernacle. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. And that's how the book of Exodus ends, where this tabernacle, this tent of meeting, where they could meet Moses particularly could go in and meet God face to face. Now he has given access for the people to have relationship with himself. That is how the book of Exodus ends, by God inhabiting the tent of meeting. Now I want you to see how the book of Leviticus begins. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. And off he goes, laying out the law. All of these statutes, all these regulations, these laws by which they can live in relationship with God 
particularly from the tabernacle. And so in the book of Exodus, we start to see how God has designed the relationship that he secured with the people of Israel when he rescued them out of Egypt, that he provided for when he had them design the tabernacle, and now he wants to show them how they actually are in relationship with him. And so they have all of these laws in the book of Leviticus. When you go to Numbers, particularly Numbers 13 and 14, let me just summarize by saying that the people have been wandering. It talks about how they would follow the cloud. When it would pick up and go, they would follow it. And they would stop when he would stop. And they wandered. The reason they wandered is because they didn't follow very well. Like days after they are rescued out of Egypt, they're whining to go back to Egypt because they're hungry and thirsty. And so they have been wandering, and yet in Numbers 13 and 14, God has spies sent into Canaan. Now, Canaan is the promised land that he told Abram, I'm going to send you to this place. It's Canaan. All the way back in Genesis, he promised Abram, I'm going to take you to the land of Canaan. And he tells them all these years later, he tells them, now it's time. I want you to set apart these men. I want them to go and investigate the land that I have promised to give you all this time. And many of you probably know the story. This group of men go in and they investigate. They spy out the land of Canaan and they come back and they give what kind of report? They give a very nerve-wracking report. They say, there is no way we can do this. The people are huge we will get conquered. We can't do it. There are only two, Joshua and Caleb, who say, no, we can do this. God's promised it to us, and we can go, and he will give us victory. But they get outnumbered. The people believe the naysayers. And so now God is looking at a group of people that he has rescued out of Egypt. By all of these miracles, he sent gnats. He sent boils. He changed water to blood. He had them cross the Red Sea on dry ground. He conquered Pharaoh and the army. He provided manna for them and quail for them and took care of them. And they, they didn't wear out while they were wandering. And yet when it was time to go into the promised land, all these years, all these generations after he promised to Abraham what he was going to do, they said, no, thank you. And so God says, fine, none of y'all are going to go in. And so he waited them out until they all died, but Joshua and Caleb. And so what we do is we find ourselves in the book of Deuteronomy with the next generation. The book of Deuteronomy is basically a handful of sermons that Moses preaches to the kids of those who were rescued out of Egypt. Deuteronomy means second law. It's the second time around. And Moses is giving this charge because now it is time. God is going to move his people into the promised land. He's using Moses' preaching ministry to get them ready. And what I want you to do is go to Deuteronomy 34 with me. In Deuteronomy 34, the very end of the book of Deuteronomy, we read about the death of Moses. So let's just read this passage. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. That had to be a tough moment for Moses. He had a weak moment of leadership. And because of that, God had told him, you're not going in. He says, I've let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning were, uh, for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. 
So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not risen a prophet in Israel like uh, since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. None like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And that is how the book of Deuteronomy ends. And I would say that's how the first main section of the Bible ends. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. So that's the end of Deuteronomy. Now, it mentioned who is going to succeed Moses, a man named Joshua. Flip the page. The next book of the Bible is the book of Joshua. And I want you to see this scene. Look at the first verse. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is buried, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I have promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Now, I just want you, let's just take a moment and just kind of have a little devotion time here. Can you imagine being Joshua? You, do you realize the momentous occasion that this is? God is saying, Joshua, it's time, like it or not. Because God has a plan to redeem his people. And that plan he ignited when he called Abram generations before. And he's a patient God, but he's going to get the job done. And he's telling Joshua, it is time, and you're the man that's going to take them across. He tells them, he tells Joshua, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Verse 6, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Who wrote that book? Moses wrote that book. God told him, write this book. So that's the book he's talking about. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And off they go in the book of Joshua. They start to take their promised land. In chapter 3, they cross the Jordan. It is very similar to the way they cross the Red Sea. They cross on dry ground miraculously. And they begin to take over the nations of the land of Canaan. They have their setbacks. They have their hiccups. But they start to take over the land that God had promised all along. And so the book of Joshua is filled with all of these battles of them just conquering people, invading Canaan, dealing with enemies, so on and so forth. I want you to go to Joshua 24, and I want us to see how the book of Joshua ends. It ends with a section of Joshua's death and burial in chapter 24, verse 29. After these things, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old, and they buried him in his own inheritance at timnath Sarah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. As for the bones of Joseph which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem in the, pl in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance of the descendants of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas, his son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. And that is how the book of Joshua ends. The death of Joshua, a reminder of the bones of Joseph, Look at the next page, and let's see how the book of Judges begins. After the death of, Mo of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? They need a leader now. They are still 
taking over the promised land. They need someone to lead them. And we see the seam that this book begins by narrating that this is just after the death of Moses. I keep saying Moses. The death of Joshua. The story just continues on. Now, for what it's worth, the book of uh, Judges has this cycle to it where the people sin and rebel and languish and start to suffer and they get oppressed. And when they finally get oppressed and have had enough, they cry out to God for a redeemer. God sends a judge who comes and rescues them and they're living life happy again. And it starts all over. Once they're rescued, then they start to sin and rebel, turn away. They get oppressed conquered they start to call out to god god brings a deliverer a judge they get rescued and so on and so forth does that sound like human nature to you just this cycle on and on and on well i want you to see how the book of judges ends judges chapter 21 by the way in the book of judges you might know stories uh, of gideon and samson so on there's several others that's where uh, these all take place in the book of Judges. In Judges 21, verse 25, I want you to see how the book of Judges ends. In those days, in other words, the days of the Judges, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That, by the way, just sounds like our culture. Everyone does what they think is right, and we're all so wise, and we put our wisdom all over Facebook. Because that benefits humanity. In those days, the days of the judges, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, I want you to flip the page. And I want you to see how this little tiny book, the book of Ruth, begins. In the days when the judges ruled. Y'all see the seam, the connection? Now, we're going to go further, obviously. But before we do, let me just... Kind of check our temperature. Is anybody finding this interesting and neat and encouraging the way that God is just designing his word? I I wish 20 years ago, and I'm sure that I had preachers and Sunday school teachers and all that teachers telling me this, and I don't know, it didn't click, but man, to know these kinds of things and to see how it's designed, it's so helpful. It's, It's inspiring to me. It's the kind of thing that, wow, like we really can put our trust in God's word, look how well he's put it together. And so we find ourselves in this little book called Ruth, and it begins by connecting to the book of Judges. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, uh, just, just a little side note, Bethlehem means house of bread there is a famine there is a lack of bread in the house of bread that's just a cool thing about the way the book of ruth starts but the book of ruth is this really quaint story Uh, it's a love story it is a, a story of god really working seemingly behind the scenes to get his will accomplished what i want you to do is i want you to turn to the end of the book of ruth chapter 4 verse 18 Let me just summarize the love story. Uh, Ruth meets a man named Boaz, and through some very interesting and awkward courtship, uh, they fall in love, and they marry, and they start to have babies. And in Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, I want you to see uh, what happens here. Actually, let's back up and go to verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, that's the baby, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Okay? That's the David. That's King David. Ruth took place in the days of who? The judges. And in the days of the judges, there was no what? King. And yet God is working all along. He can even work through or use a famine 
And he can unite people of, of countries that don't belong together. And, and in this little book of Ruth, we see that redemptive history is forging ahead because the divine author is sovereign and provident, and he knows exactly what he's doing. And all of a sudden, we see that the family of David pops into the picture. And so in 1 Samuel, you start to read the narrative of the life and leadership of the kings, particularly King David. 1 Samuel 16, shepherd boy David is anointed king. And in chapter 17, he takes out Goliath. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, the chapter that we'll come back to in a little bit, God gives a covenant promise that there would always be a son of David on the throne if they follow him. And yet, in 2 Samuel 11, chapter 11, verse 1, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabah. But David remained at Jerusalem, and it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a, a, roof, a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba the daughter? Him, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. And I would imagine you know the story of 2 Samuel 11 that David begins to commit absolute atrocities. And within two generations, his family is in complete upheaval, much like the world beginning in Genesis chapter 3. If Genesis chapter 3 through 11 shows the world in just crumbling dismay, beginning in 2 Samuel 11, you see the line of the kings, the family of David, the heritage of David, begin to crumble and the country ends up splitting. And so you have the books 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles that just highlight uh, the highs and lows of the kingdoms of Israel. And then you have the prophets who all along are calling the people to return to the Lord. And eventually, as was prophesied, the people of God are taken into exile. You have a northern, the northern country taken in 722 B.C., the southern country taken in 587. If you are familiar with the story where Daniel and his friends are taken by King Nebuchadnezzar and they're uh, told to, to bow down to the statue. They don't. They're thrown in the fire. Daniel's thrown in the lion's dead. That's King Nebuchadnezzar. That's the empire that took the people of Judah, the Jerusalem people, the people of God, took them into exile. And so now we find that the people of God are no longer in the promised land. God told Abraham, you're going to father many nations. You go where I tell you this is the promised land. He got them there. They did not follow him. And he told them, if you don't follow me, you can read how the book of Deuteronomy ends. It was my devotional reading yesterday. Whew, not the most uplifting. He says, here's what's going to happen if you don't follow me. And he pronounces all these curses. And one of them is you are going to be taken out of the promised land. You are going to be put in exile. You're going to serve a people that you don't know. You don't know how to speak their language. They are going to completely oppress you. And that is exactly what happened. But I want you to come to the end of the book of 2 Chronicles with me. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Now your, your copy of the Bible may be similar to mine. I want you to notice the caption uh, that may be at the beginning of chapter 36, Judah's decline. Judah is uh, the, the country of the people of God where Jerusalem is at this time. Uh, you basically had a civil war, so you had uh, Judah and Israel, the northern and the southern. So Judah's the southern, they start to decline. All right, Nebuchadnezzar takes the people, takes the temple, takes all the stuff into the Babylonian Empire. Jerusalem is captured and burned. If you see your caption, you might say that in verse 17. But I want you to see how the book of 2 Chronicles ends. Verse 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Now let me just let you know, the Persians took over the Babylonians. So we're fast forwarding here. 
Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the Lord God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. In other words, you're getting to go home. Turn the page. Look at the beginning of the book of Ezra. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord might, by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So God's people are getting to go home. Now, if you ever wanted evidence of a seam... Like, Ezra plagiarized his second chronicles. I mean, this is like word for word. It is fascinating. And so Ezra and Nehemiah show the story of the people of God beginning to return to the promised land. And you have the rebuilding effort. You have prophets like Haggai and Zechariah who are encouraging them to rebuild. And I want you to go to the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4. Now, yes, we just skipped over a whole chunk of Scripture, if you notice that. And we're going to talk about some of those in just a little bit. Malachi chapter 4. Again, we're just getting highlights of the story. I want us to read the end of the Old Testament. Now, I'm hoping that for many of you, you'll realize, hey, we've done this before on Sunday mornings, because I'd say about four or five times uh, we've read from Malachi 4, as we've just been walking through Matthew. Malachi 4, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name... The Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to the children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now flip the page and you will find yourself in the New Testament. And one of the things that Matthew does over and over and over again, especially as he begins his book, is he is showing us that Jesus Christ is fulfilling the Old Testament. So for those of you who were here, the very first sermon I preached once y'all had voted on me was from Matthew 1. And it was interesting preaching from a genealogy. It's one of those sections that make people think, oh, the Bible's so boring. No, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And he goes to this whole genealogy in Matthew 1 through 4 over and over and over again shows how Jesus recapitulates the experience of the people of God in the Old Testament, even going into temptation in the wilderness, being baptized in the Jordan, the boundary of the promised land, so on. And so we launch into the New Testament where you have the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of those showing the life, ministry, death, and resurrection, and ascension Of Jesus Christ. And what I want you to do is I want you to go to the end of the book of Luke. Luke 24. I hope you are hanging in here with me. I warned you. Luke 24. Jesus is risen from the dead. We're going to come back uh, to Luke 24 also later. But I want you to see uh, beginning of verse 48. Luke 24 verse 48. Jesus tells his disciples, you are witnesses of these things. 
And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. They are now waiting for power to come on them from on high. So how about you turn to the book of Acts with me? Acts chapter 1, and let's see how this connects. As we noted previously, Luke wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. That's what we just read about. After he had given commands to the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, Jesus was lifted up, and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, he said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And now they are also here waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that in a little bit. And so the book of Acts tells the story of the church being born. And I mean like ignited Thousands and thousands and thousands of people come to know Jesus as the Messiah. So the life and ministry and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus ushers in this time where now by the Holy Spirit's power, God's people are continuing to take the name of Jesus into the nations. And I want you to see how the book of Acts ends. One more scene that I want us to notice. The book of Acts ends with the Apostle Paul, who had a particular calling to the nations, to Gentiles. He is in Rome, imprisoned, and yet God is empowering him for ministry. So in Acts chapter 28, verse 30, the book ends by telling us that Paul lived in Rome two whole years at his own expense, and he welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness And without hindrance. So he is in Rome teaching people about Jesus. Flip the page. And you have a letter to the church in Rome. And so we see that Paul's writings and his teachings are now in this section of letters. And so I want you to see how it just continues to go. And and this idea where Paul, who had been doing ministry all along, while he was in prison several times, wrote letters, but he ends his life in Rome, but he had already written a letter to the church in Rome. And so we see that God has just ordained his word all the way through. And so you have these letters, and then finally we wait for another return. This time it is not the return of the people of God from exile. It is the return of Jesus Christ himself. The Bible ends, Revelation 22 Verse 20 and 21, he who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. And some of you are saying, Amen. We're done with that. <clears throat> so that, that's the tour. That is just the highlights. That's skimming across the surface. The meta narrative highlights. Of the Bible. That is one aspect to show us that the Bible is one book. It has a unity that I hope maybe now more than ever you are marveling at. Even as I read through this, to even like right now these moments, I'm still like, wow, like look at this. Look how unified the Bible is as one book inspired by a divine author. We have to value and cherish and benefit from the unity of the Bible. 
I want to also show you some motifs. Now, we're just changing gears. I want, you to show, I want to show you how there is unity in themes. Now, these are just some examples. So we are about to go through another tour. All right, if you are worn out from the first one, just sit back. It is okay. These are recorded. You got your outline. Just take a deep breath if you need to. But I'm going to invite you to go back to Genesis 12 if you would like. And just in case you're wondering, I really do mean it when this is actually fun for me. <laughs> this is so fun. I, we can tell. <laughs> you said you were going to behave. All right, you tell me that. I'll call you out while we're being recorded here. All right, Genesis 12. I'm glad you do. Genesis 12. Let's go back here. Now, Genesis 1 through 11, the world has become an absolute mess. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and from your kindred folly, uh, and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is the covenant that God gives to Abram. That's the blank there if you want to write in your notes. This is a motif. I'm just showing you a theme in the Bible. In this case, it is the covenant. In Genesis 12, we see that God gives this covenant, this promise to Abram. Follow me. I'm going to make your name great. That's what the people in Genesis 11 wanted. They wanted a great name, so they thought they'd build a tower. That's not how God does things. He calls Abram. He says, your name is going to be great. And in you, all the families of the earth, I think all the nations, all the people groups, will be blessed. That is the covenant God gives to Abraham. In this case, Abram, he would later be called Abram, Abraham. So if you flip to 2 Samuel 7, I want you to see another covenant. And this time, God makes it with David. 2 Samuel 7. David wanted to build a house for God. God said, no, I'm going to build you a house. So let's begin reading in verse 9. I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name. Does that sound familiar? That's what he told Abram. Like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. That's God's covenant with David. We got a problem. We just talked about how this, I mean, this thing hits the fan. Like this is 2 Samuel chapter 7. It's chapter 11 when he goes off and casts shenanigans with Bathsheba. And it does not go well after that. And so now we're left wondering what happens to the covenant where God says your throne is going to be made sure forever. We'll turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. You may remember that Jeremiah was mentioned. Jeremiah chapter 31. Begin reading in verse 31. So chapter 31, verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Look to chapter 33. Chapter 33, verse 14. The Lord's eternal covenant with David. 
Behold, the days are coming to close, Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical, Levitical priest, there we go, shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. There is this new covenant that God has promised. I want you to flip to Matthew 26. Again, we are just talking about a theme, a motif that runs through Scripture. One example of many showing us the unity of the Bible. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about, God would remember their sins no more. This is for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Go to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11, verses 23. This is what I read whenever we celebrate the Lord's Supper as a church family. Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So think about this. When you and I celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are participating. We are in remembrance, reenacting, remembering the new covenant that was secured by Jesus Christ's body and blood. So this, this theme of covenant, it's, it's neat how it runs through Scripture, but like it, there's a reason for it. You and I are actually experiencing it, maybe in ways, ways we don't think about all the time. So that's one example of a motif. Uh, we, we can go quicker on these other ones. There's the, the theme or the motif of the nations. So we won't turn there, but if you think about it, in Genesis 10, you have this table of nations. In Genesis 11, all the nations come together as one, and they try to build this temple up to heaven. God says, that's not going to work. So he comes down to see their cute little temple. And he obliterates their plans. He scatters the nations. They start to spread. Then he calls Abram, says, I want you to follow me. I'm going to bless all the nations through you. He takes them to the promised land, which has a handful of nations in it. Canaan has like seven nations in it. But I do want you to remember what Matthew says in chapter 28, the very end. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We did that today. Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I do want you to go to Acts chapter 2 with me. I want you to see something neat here. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When the day of Pentecost arrived, just catch up when you get there. They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together. They were bewildered because each one is hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? 
How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. What's just happened? Acts chapter 2 has just reversed Genesis chapter 11. Is that not awesome? These are the nations gathering together. Now they are hearing the mighty work of God. Go to Revelation 7 with me. Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So today, during the Sunday school hour, I met with a couple who joined our church. And one of the things that I talk about with people who join our church is that I believe God wants to use this church family for the nations. This is the foundation. Why? Because there's this theme, this thread where Jesus is fulfilling the promise of God to redeem the nations. So I really mean it when I say that we have a horizon as a church family and God wants us to just keep taking steps towards it. He wants to use us to take his name to the nations. We are part of what God is doing. And speaking of before the throne, before the Lamb, That's just the next example of motif, lamb. In Exodus 12, God starts to talk about the Passover lamb. You're going to sacrifice this lamb. You're going to spread the blood of the lamb on the door. And if I see the blood of the lamb, I'm going to pass over. You're not going to receive my wrath. And so those who did it were saved. They were able to uh, walk and get rescued in the Exodus. And then God starts to have a relationship with his people. And one of the things they had to do is offer sacrifices. They had to have perfect, spotless unblemished lambs and they had to shed the blood of those lambs to pay for their sins to atone for their sins and in john chapter 1 verse 21 john the baptist sees jesus and he says behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world so when jesus's blood is shed he is the lamb of god who once and for all pays the penalty he pays the atonement for our sins which is why all the nations surround him and his throne In Revelation chapter 7, that's just another motif. We could go on and on and on. Let's just take a break for a moment. All this this snickering. You see what I did there? I appreciate y'all laughing. There's nothing worse when you say a joke and it's like... The second service, y'all sense of humor is lacking compared to the first service, by the way. I don't know. I just have better humor for those people. Discussion. What are the implications of the Bible being a unified book? I want you to think about this. Broad question, I know. What are the implications of the Bible being a unified book? I'm going to tell you implications of how we read it and how I go about preaching it. But before I do, I want to hear from you. Uh, We'll throw a couple snickers your way. But while you ponder... Let's do a couple giveaways. So y'all think about it for a moment. Uh, Here's the question again. What are the implications of the Bible being a unified book? All right. Let's give away gospel-centered teaching. All right. The proud new owner of gospel-centered teaching by Trevin Wax is Philip Vaughn. Philip is overjoyed, I can tell by the smile on your face. You won last week too, didn't you? Congratulations, all right. God must think you really need to do some reading. You need to shore up. All right, now this one here, now I got to say, I'm so glad I have my own because it would be hard to get rid of this. This here, this here is the Introduction to Biblical Interpretation, third edition, thank you very much. By William W. Klein, Craig L. Blomberg, and Robert L. Hubbard, Jr. Okay. This is, 
Let's see how we're doing here. Uh, some 680 pages of fun right here. This is hermeneutical treasure wrapped up in sugar. This, I, in all seriousness, this is an awesome book. I've only read like certain sections of it, but this is absolutely fantastic. Very similar to the one that I gave away the first time. It's a reference work, okay? So this is a power tool. This, uh, what did I give away? Was it an air compressor last time? This is like a jackhammer, okay? So like you gotta, you gotta, you know, be careful with something like this. But you put this on your shelf, you gotta take it back, or, you know, take it down, use it. Uh, so this is gonna be in the library of. I've been so excited to give this book away. Lee Bozeman. So the Lord, the Lord must think you've got some reading to do because this is the second book you've won. By the way, when Brenton Bennett won last week, he wasn't here. I pulled a second name and he came running in. It was Lee Bozeman's name I pulled. So let me just tell you, you, you won out right there. That is an absolutely awesome book. All right. What are the implications of the Bible being a unified book? Let's get a couple thoughts. Raise your hand. I'll throw a Snickers at you. I saw, I saw Becky's hand in the back. Yep. Absolutely. So in case you couldn't hear, the, the unity of the Bible points to the sovereignty of God. It points to the nature of God. It, like when we read the Bible and see this, I hope we, we are actually more worshipful. As, as nerdy as it may sound, when you see the seams, like we should worship more because like, wow, like he knew what he was doing. The, last week you didn't want one. Do you want one? We're conferring. I'm throwing it because I can. Ready? Oh! I would take the blame, but I mean like I put that perfectly. Okay, that, that was right in your hand. It's all right. Okay. All right. There's a Snickers on the floor somewhere unless someone's scrambling to get it. One more thought. What what are the implications of the unity of the book? Yeah, Con? Yep. Trinity, that's another example where you can go through it, you can just see evidence of it. You want me to like thread this your way? No, I don't want to hit John in the face. Let me pass this to you. Absolutely. Look, well, I want to share a couple categories of implications uh, of the Bible's unity. I want us to think about how we read it. All right, so when you're reading the Bible, and now that we realize more and more how unified it is, let it inform your reading. Let me try to encourage you not to play hopscotch with the Bible, at least not as much as maybe we usually do. And I've got a little smiley face right here, so this is you know, I'm not saying this in some legalistic way, but, but, you know, the game Hopscotch, you're just skipping along, and you put your foot here, then you jump over here, put your foot there. It's been quite a while since I played Hopscotch, but that's how I remember it. We don't want to do that too much with the Bible. If all we're doing is just hop, skip, and jump through this, and, and maybe today we read a verse out of here, and tomorrow here, um, uh, then, then we're not really getting it like we could. We, we're not benefiting from it as much as possible. So when you're reading, keep the main plot line in mind. Try to think about where you are. If you're reading in the Psalms and you're reading a Psalm of David, remember, okay, David was like the king in Israel, like the ultimate earthly king. And so you might have a lot of light shed on reading that Psalm, remembering what his leadership story was like. Uh, when you're reading in the book of Deuteronomy, and you remember this is the second generation, this is the children of those who were so unfaithful. Now they are the ones who are about to walk into the promised land. After over 400 years, because they spent 400 years in Egypt, and that was actually promised to Abraham, and all the, the riches of the context. I want you to try to keep those things in mind. So maybe you're not just playing hopscotch with the Bible. So if you need a reading plan that can help, uh, we can help steer you towards that. Uh, but if we play hopscotch with the Bible, we can benefit from it, surely. There are times where I'll just go to a portion of Scripture and I just kind of chew on it. But, but the benefit of really reading through Scripture and understanding the storyline is immeasurable. So I want you to keep the plot line in mind. It may be helpful just to read through all these references we've just looked over, especially the one where he walked through the highlights of the meta-narrative. Keeping those things in mind, very helpful list of references 
uh, to kind of nail down. My last implication for your reading is I want to encourage you to savor the story's details. So knowing the story helps us read it. If you know the story, especially if you already know how it's going to end, you start to better understand previous scenes and previous episodes and previous details, and you can start to really savor those. So I, I highlighted very briefly the book of Ruth. Like we should do in Ember Lectures in Ruth. It is absolutely fascinating. But the book of Ruth is this little sliver in the Bible. It's just this little detail. It almost seems insignificant, but you start to savor it. You see how it fits in the storyline. You see how God's sovereignty shines through it, and you start to realize, wow, like this word of God is absolutely rich. So savor the details of the storyline. That's how the unity of the Bible can inform your reading of it. I want to tell you how uh, a couple ways that the unity of the Bible informs my preaching of it. I want you to know how I approach the preaching ministry. Number one, I must preach the whole counsel of God. So Paul tells uh, the leaders in Ephesus as he's leaving them, look, he says, I preach the whole counsel of God. I feel absolutely convicted and called to try to be thorough with this for you. As a shepherd called to feed sheep, I want to preach from the whole counsel of God. This is the book God inspired. This is a unified book that shows the nature of God. So it is not my job to just pick the parts I like. Hopefully this morning showed that. This morning in a weird way was both inspiring and yet kind of challenging to preach. It's not like this fun passage. Cut off your hand. Yay. Come to this church. You know. But we have to preach the whole counsel of God. That's one way that the unity of the Bible informs my preaching. The second is that I have to preach every text in its context. It's local context, but also it's canonical context. The canon of Scripture, the entirety of Scripture. Whenever I am studying a passage of Scripture, one of the things I have to do in order to preach it faithfully and effectively is to make sure I'm fitting it in the context it's in the Scripture. The storyline, the canon, so it affects my preaching, the unity of the Bible. So that is the Bible as one book. I do not think we're going to take as long on these remaining points. If we are, uh, we will be here till about 1 a.m. Let's talk about the Bible as two testaments. And I do want to remind you, if you have to go, feel free uh, to go. It is 518. Uh, for those of you who need to know what time it is, I want to talk about the Bible as two testaments. The word testament is essentially the word for covenant. It's the idea of a will. So one of those, those death concepts, the will, you have the Old Testament, the New Testament. I want to go ahead and ask another question for discussion. I want you to ponder this. How would you explain the relationship between the Old and New Testament? How would you explain the relationship between the Old and New Testament? Now, if you were given one of those two awesome books, you can't cheat and read the book real quick and answer it. I just want you to think, how would you explain the relationship between the Old and New Testament. Ponder that for a moment, and I'm going to give away a couple books. How would you explain, like if your child or grandchild asked you, what's the relationship between the Old and New Testament? They ask stuff like that. They don't. But if they did, what would you say? Let's go ahead and give away a copy of Gospel-Centered Teaching. Trevin Wax, let's see, this is... Yellow bowl here. This one popped out. Linda LeBrewer. Which side? There we are. Two hands up. Revival. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. By the way, if you got a book, Gospel Center Teaching, that means you're volunteering to teach a Sunday school class or a small group. We appreciate that. Now, here we go. Some of y'all may have been eyeing this. This is the ESV Study Bible. Y'all, we are not given cheapo gifts, okay? We are given like, this is, oh gosh, power tools, power tools, power tools. What's another power tool? A bull. <laughs> this is, hey, this is an earth mover, okay? This is an earth mover. This is the ESV Study Bible. So many people have asked before, I preach from the English Standard Version, the ESV. There's several good ones out there. This is the one that I decided once I landed here that I was going to preach from it for a couple reasons. And so this is the ESV Study Bible. So this is basically like a Bible with uh, a very brief commentary 
wrapped into one. On each page, there are also study notes. Uh, and so this is an absolute fantastic resource. And it is going to belong to God's favorite teacher. Because God would obviously pick his favorite teacher to get... No, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. Missy Shumpert. It's, yeah. All right. Okay. You, can have, you have a month to memorize it. All right. I'm so excited about this last one, though. Okay, the question was, um, how would you explain the relationship between the Old and the New Testament? Jeff. Oh, I was about to hit you. Okay, say that one more time. Okay. All right, so for those of you who couldn't hear, he says that the prophecy is revealed in the Old Testament and the prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament. Do you all think he passed? Absolutely. Good job. There's a Snickers for you. One more? Anyone else want to explain the relationship between the Old and New Testament? Marielle? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. She says the Old Testament sets the beginning with rules, regulations, and covenant, and then the New Testament fulfills it, which is actually very, very true, theologically sound. So thank you both. Enjoy your Snickers. The, you're welcome. The relationship between the Old and New Testament, would you believe that like libraries worth of literature has been written on this question? It's, it is a profound question. I love reading about it. Uh, let me give you my little synopsis, and this is nothing original to me. This is just one of the ways you hear people discuss it all the time, the relationship between the two testaments. This is going to sound very similar to what both Jeff and Mariel said. The old prepares for the new. The new fulfills the old. The old prepares for the new, the new fulfills the old. Now, go back to Malachi chapter 4. I want us just to look at verse 5 again. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Now, what I'm about to do in three, three little textual relationships here, this is embarrassingly small. This is like very scanty evidence, but you guys were... Uh, warriors with me through our first tour, so we don't want to overdo it. But let me just give you a few little evidences of how the old prepares for the new, how the new fulfills the old. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus. In, chapter, in verse 4, he wears a garment of camel's hair, and the leather belt around his waist. That's how Elijah dressed. So they were fashion forward. His food was locust and wild honey. So he was probably very skinny. Although I always picture him as a big guy. I don't know how you get very big eating a locust. But anyway, so John the Baptist basically resembles Elijah. And he is the one who prepares the way for the Messiah. The old prepares for the New Testament. The New Testament fulfills the old. Think back to Genesis chapter 1, or just go back there with me. Genesis chapter 1. Again, just a couple quick examples. Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God starts creating in the beginning, in the book of John, as you may recall from our Christmas series. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 14. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That is Jesus, the Old Testament, prepared for the new. The new fulfilled the old. Go to Genesis 3.15. This one maybe we'll just spend just a moment on, not super long, just a quick little moment. Genesis three fifteen. Now let me just 
catch you guys up to what's happened. So Adam and Eve have both fallen prey to the devil's schemes, the serpent schemes. God comes looking for them, and he finds them, and they both blame someone else. Okay, so that's just what we do. She made me do it. The serpent made me do it. And so then God talks to the serpent. The Lord uh, says to the serpent in verse 14, Because you have done this, cursed are you. Okay, I want you to note that he says he's cursed. Cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, anybody know the nickname that this verse is given in interpretive history? No. The Proto-Evangelium. All right, so you can go home and impress all your friends that you learned the word Proto-Evangelium, first gospel. First, is, is the Lord calling? First gospel, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So now the serpent and the woman are going to have beef between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is referred to as the first gospel, the Proto-Evangelium, where God says there's going to be offspring, there's going to be seed, you guys are going to be in battle, and he is going to crush your head. Genesis 3.15, look at verse 24. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so now you have the serpent hearing a promise that the offspring of the woman is going to conquer him and they have driven man out of the Garden of Eden. They are now blocking the way to the tree of life. We said this the other day, that if you are stuck in sin, you don't want to have eternal life in that state. So God was gracious. We don't want them to eat from the tree of life while they're stuck in sin. We have to resolve sin first. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 20, verse 2. Revelation 20, verse 2. Now let's go ahead and read verse 1, see what John says that he saw. John says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the keys to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Look at verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Look at chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Verse 10. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. He showed me the Holy Spirit, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, when you see chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Here we see it again, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit yielding its fruit each month. Now, back in Genesis chapter 3, it would have been a major problem if they had eaten from the tree of life. But here it says the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will they be anything accursed. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and the servants will worship Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And we're going to have more on this aspect later. Those are just some examples of how we see the Old Testament preparing for the new and the new fulfilling the old, even as far apart as Genesis and Revelation. So it's one book, two testaments. I want us briefly to talk about the six sections. You can divide the Bible into six sections. You have the first five books, Genesis through Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. Are those listed out in y'all's outline? I can look. I've got it. 
Let me see what you guys were looking at real quick. Yeah, the Pentateuch, five writings. You have history, Joshua through Esther. You have writings, Job through Song of Solomon. The prophets, Isaiah through Malachi, the Gospels and Acts. You have the letters. You'd include uh, Revelation with those letters, Romans through Revelation. I, don't, I want to show you something. I'm not giving this away, uh, but maybe next year. I just got this. This is one of my new tools here. This is a copy of the Bible in the six sections that I just talked about. This is really, really cool because uh, it is published in a way where I'll pull out the Gospels here. It's published in a way where there are no chapter or verse markings. I don't know how well you can see this. But I'm really excited to read through this over time because sometimes the chapter markings and divisions and the verse divisions can actually kind of confuse you a little bit. They're very helpful, obviously, but sometimes they can throw you off. Uh, but I wanted to pull this out, number one, because it's awesome, so I wanted to show it off. But number two, it shows you the six sections that I just talked about. Uh, this is the ESV, what is this called? The, I think it's called the ESV Readers. But anyway, I'm kind of thinking that maybe we'll see this as a giveaway uh, sometime down the road. But those are the six sections. So if you want to just kind of uh, kind of think of it in those chunks, those six sections, that can be very helpful. Let's talk about the Bible as many genres. All right? The word genre is sort of like a, a category of literature. Uh, I want you to think about why we should care about genres. So if you don't know what genre is, don't try to answer this question because that would be awkward. But for those of you that know what a genre is, why do you think we should care about genre? I want you to think about the question, and we are going to do our final giveaways. So why should we care about genre? All right, our final giveaways. This is sort of a bittersweet moment here. We are giving the last copy of Gospel Center Teaching to... All right, mix that up real good. Marshall Gregory... There he is. Everybody give Marshall a round of applause. All right. Thank you very much for being here. Enjoy it. Now, this last book, I am so excited to give away because this book is awesome. It's the biggest one, which is always cool. But it is called Commentary on the New Testament Use of the Old Testament. Exactly. <laughs> right? Commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament edited by G.K. Beale and D.A. Carson, okay? So that just makes it even that much cooler. Look at the size of the font in this. All right, now this is, this is actually an awesome book. Let me go here. Let's see what's the page count here. Yeah, we're, we're hitting four digits here, people. This is 1,158, excuse me, 61 pages of absolute gold. What this does is it goes through the New Testament. Let me remove this so you don't know how much you paid for it. Uh, this goes through the New Testament, and it's a commentary. Whenever the New Testament cites, refers to, alludes to the Old Testament, it talks about it. So, like, this is sitting on one of my shelves. Don't even doubt it. And whoever gets this is about to get, like, the power tool of all power tools. And it is going to... I'm almost nervous. Tish Klontz. Where's Tish? All right. Give Tish a round of applause. So, like, you were... The preschoolers are going to absolutely love it. Yes. Yes. Chapin Baptist Preschool Seminary. Oh, man. I trust the Lord's sovereignty. The preschoolers are going to benefit from that right there. Awesome. Okay. Our, our giveaways are over, everybody. How does that make you all feel on the inside? Raise your hand if you're sad you didn't win one. Yeah. I was told of someone who was in, in a room out watching it on the TV a couple weeks ago, and they were like, hey, you let him know. If he calls my name, I am busting through those doors to go get. So that's all right. We'll have to wait till next time. Wait till next time. All right. Why should we care about genre? Why does it matter that there are different genres in the Bible? Anybody have thoughts? Kathy?
Absolutely. So in case you didn't hear, if there weren't a variety of genres in the Bible, it would get pretty boring, maybe monotonous. And she explained there are different kinds of literature in the Bible. Narrative, poetry, what else did you mention? One more, I think. Allegory. So I'm going to try to thread this. So Gary, Linda, look out. Okay. She stands up, warms up. There we go. All right. All right. We're going to end strong here in this fourth lecture. Someone else. Why, why is it important? That different, yeah, Kathy. Okay. Absolutely. So she said God's made us differently. Some of us adhere. Uh, well, that's not the word adhere. Some of us maybe are inclined to appreciate different types of writing more than others. Claude, Missy, hang in there. Oh, you don't want it. I can't throw it at you if you're going to do this. Well, knock Claude out with the Snickers. Claude, do you want the Snickers? No. <laughs> what am I supposed to do now? Oh, my goodness. Don't ruin your appetite now. All right. He wants a Reese's. I mean, Reese's are okay, but <sighs> Lord have mercy on him. All right. Genre goes back to the idea of authorial intent. God as the divine author, the human authors that he inspired wrote with variety, wrote with creativity. And so there is that aspect. So Kathy, uh, the first Kathy gave us the first answer. The reason it matters is because there is a variety, there is a creativity in how God has written his word. The second one is that the genre very much informs how we interpret a passage. So you do not interpret the phone book the same way that you interpret or read the love letter from your spouse, do you? No, the answer is no, by the way. And don't write a love letter that reads like a phone book, by the way. All right? We don't interpret a menu at a restaurant the same way that we interpret the lyrics of our favorite song. We don't go about reading things that are written differently in the exact same way. So let's just survey the genres of Scripture first. Narrative. All right, narrative. That's the first one that Kathy mentioned. Uh, there are some subcategories I want you to know about. Historical narrative. Basically, think about it this way. A story from history. A story from history. Historical narrative. There's a lot of that uh, in the Bible. You can think about the story of Joseph. We already mentioned that. Genesis 37 to 50 is this narrative. It is a story from the history of the world, from God's redemptive history it is the narrative of Joseph. Uh, it is a fascinating account in and of itself, and yet it also fits within the broader narrative of Scripture. So you find narrative in all sorts, vast amounts of the Old Testament. You find narrative in the Gospels and Acts mainly. Speaking of the Gospels, Gospel is sort of a, a subgenre of its own. Uh, lots of people, excuse me while I wrestle with this. Now I'm just getting prideful. I'm going to make this, there we go. Gospel is a narrative slash biography slash proclamation of good news in Jesus. Let me just say that again. The gospel is a narrative slash biography slash proclamation of good news in Jesus. And even that is maybe just a simplified definition of what gospel is. The locations of gospel are in the four gospel accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are all still examples of narratives. And yet parable. Sort of another subcategory. The word parable is two words in Greek put together. Para, bale. Para means beside or with. Bale is cast. So when Jesus casts out demons, he ekbales them. And so this idea of being cast beside, being put next to you, it's a story with two meanings. You tell the story and then it has this meaning next to it that you have to interpret. So in Luke 15, the people are complaining because Jesus is hanging out with those who don't deserve him, right? Self-righteous people complain, so he tells the parables of Luke 15. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the prodigal son. It's these stories that you can just read as a story. It makes perfect sense, and then you realize there's an extra layer of meaning next to it because it is a parable. We start to realize that we are the lost sheep. We are the lost coin. We are the lost son. We're the older brother. God's the father, so on and so forth. Those are parables. Those are all examples of narratives. Then you have law. That's the next main genre. These are rules, guidelines, regulations, etc. One example would be Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, the, the Ten Commandments. You find 
uh, law mainly in Exodus chapter thir- uh, 20, verse 31, in the book of Leviticus. We already kind of saw the seam of those two books already. Uh, then you have prophecy. Prophecy is foretelling and forthtelling from a preacher. Let me explain what I mean. In the uh, Bible, when people prophesy, a lot of times they are foretelling something. They're telling something that is going to happen in the future. But also, prophecy is this idea of foretelling, just telling it like it is, telling the truth. So if, if I do a spiritual gifts inventory, most likely prophecy is going to be somewhere up there. And my job is not to tell the future. That's, that's done. This is a closed canon. There's no more like revealed revelation God's going to give us. I just simply explain it. I have to tell it like it is. I have to foretell. Uh, so when I preach, I am prophesying in that sense. But in the Bible, the genre of prophecy is both foretelling and foretelling from a preacher, a man who's called to proclaim. So an example would be Joel, but you have all the prophets, and you have other parts in other parts of the Bible where you see someone uh, carrying out a brief prophecy here and there. So let's stop right there for a moment. So we have narrative, law, and prophecy. I want you to think about narrative and law, and think about how different it is to read these. Now, for what it's worth, you find law in narrative. But if you're going to read the story of the Tower of Babel, you're going to read that, interpret that, and enjoy that in one way, and then you're going to get to the law of how to cleanse a leper. It's just different. And so we have to know how to approach it. How do we interpret it differently? We do not have time to go into all that at all tonight, uh, but I do want you to be aware of these genres. Then you go to prophecy, and all of a sudden prophecy is just bizarre sometimes, and it'll leave you scratching your head. What is he talking about? Why does he sound like he's talking about the future and the present or the past? I mean, it's just really this strange way to speak and write, and yet God has designed it to foretell and foretell his words to his people. Mainly, by the way, prophets were used to warn people into repentance. They pronounced the judgment of God on people's sin and rebellion, but always for the effort of calling them to repent. So you have narrative, law, you have prophecy, you have poetry. Poetry, this is just a a definition I threw down. This is non-prose with rhythm and rhyme, okay? There's going to be rhythm and rhyme. Some examples, Psalm 119. Anybody know the interesting uh, characteristic of Psalm 119, how it's designed? You'll notice it's a really long one, right? So it's designed where each little section starts with the letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So there's rhythm to it. There's design to it. The Psalms are filled with poetry. Proverbs are filled with poetry. The Song of Solomon is absolutely just chock full of poetry and imagery and all this stuff, the symbolism. So you're going to find poetry in the book of Job, the book of Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. This this one right here is actually called poetry, and that's all of those books that I just listed out to you. So you have narrative, law, prophecy, poetry. You have epistle. Anybody know what epistle means? That's a fancy word for what? Letter. Yeah, it's just simply a letter. I guess people just continue to use the word epistle because it sounds fancy. But uh, those are Romans, Romans through Jude. Uh, You could kind of include Revelation. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, those letters are examples of an epistle. So all of a sudden, you have a different type of writing. It goes in the book of Acts. There's this story being narrated. And we watch as Paul is called into his ministry. All these journeys, stories, plots, uh, high moments, low moments, challenges, victories. And it ends with him proclaiming uh, the kingdom of God with all boldness. And then the next section of the Bible is all these letters that he has written throughout his ministry. So there's always intrigue to find out, well, when did he write this letter? And where do we kind of find that, where we think that happened in the book of Acts and so on and so forth? And there's these letters. And so it's got the greeting and the body of the letter and the conclusion. Y'all remember learning how to write a letter? And uh, when would that have been, like middle school or something? It's, it's that kind of thing. It's designed differently. We read it differently than we do uh, the Song of Solomon. Just so you know, you need to read the book of Romans differently than you read the Song of Solomon. They're different. If you try to read them the same way, it would cause some confusion. Then you have apocalyptic. Apocalyptic, just so you know, A-P-O-C-A-L-Y-P-T-I-C. A-P-O, 
C-A-L-Y-P-T-I-C. That means revelation. It's the idea of a vision. You find it in the book of Revelation. What other book has a lot of it? Do you know? Daniel. Yeah, so Daniel and Revelation are really the key, the key places of apocalyptic, which is Revelation. And, and this is just different all in and of itself. I mean, the book of Revelation like, is a letter. It's a vision. It's prophecy. It's poetry. It's, it's visions. I mean, it is just eye-opening. And so when, when the day comes, when God calls us to preach through Revelation, we need to make sure that we approach it appropriately. You think of how many people approach Revelation the wrong way and how many conclusions that can lead to. And we have to approach it in its genre appropriately. Those are the main genres of Scripture. There are, there are other different categories. You might have like a census or lists or things like that, but those are the main ones. All right, well, I want to I wanna bring it home. I want to bring this whole set of lectures home. I want you to turn to John chapter 5. And again, I just want to thank you. You have sat here for an hour and 46 minutes. I've been having fun. So if you have not, just thank you for sitting there while I've been having fun. John chapter 5, I want us to talk about how we read the Bible with a Christ-centered interpretation. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of Scripture. And I intend to spend the rest of my life in ministry trying to continually make sure that I pursue interpreting the Bible accordingly. So in John chapter 5, Jesus is in this argument uh, with some people who think they know better. I want you to look at verse 39, John 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Do we find eternal life in scriptures? Absolutely. So it's, at first it sounds counterintuitive. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Now remember, when he says the scriptures to these Pharisees and leaders and scribes, what is he talking about? He's talking about what we re refer to as the Old Testament, these first four right here. You search those scriptures because you think that you're going to find life in them. It is those scriptures that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus fulfills the scriptures. The very purpose of the scriptures is to point people to eternal life in Jesus. Go down to verse 46. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my works? This is interesting. So this is what he's talking about, the Pentateuch, what Moses wrote. Jesus shows up here. So this is where this conversation is happening. And he's saying... If you believe what Moses had to say, you'd believe what I'm saying because he wrote about me. So if you won't believe what Moses wrote, how are you going to believe what I'm saying? Jesus fulfills Scripture. We have to interpret Scripture in a Christ-centered way. I want you to turn to Luke 16. There's this powerful story. Now, the overall point of the story is broader than the point I'm going to make. So let me just kind of put that caveat there. But in Luke 16, <clears throat> verse 19. Let's just read this together. Just kind of follow along. <clears throat> there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores. Now just so you know, that's the different Lazarus than the one that was raised from the dead. He desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. He saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. So let's make sure we got what's going on here. All right, so the poor man dies, and he is now with Abraham. The rich man dies, and he's in hell. But he can see Abraham and Lazarus, the man that he ignored all that time. So he called out in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. 
But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who had passed from here to you may not be, uh, yeah, may not be able and none may cross from there to us. He said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, before I keep reading, I want you to know, we are about to walk into some of the most sobering verses in Scripture. Verse 29. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. In other words, they have this and these. Let them hear them. Them. I don't need to send anyone to warn them. They have that. He says, verse 30, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Is that not chilling to hear? If they won't believe what Moses and the prophets had to say, they're not going to be convinced if someone is resurrected from the dead. Jesus Christ fulfills all of the Scripture. We can take it to the bank. We need to pour ourselves into the entire canon knowing that God has inspired it and He's inspired it with one aim, one fulfillment, and that is to glorify the name of Jesus Christ who is a fulfillment. I want you to turn to Luke 24 with me. Just stay in the book of Luke. We're going to land in Luke 24. This might be my favorite chapter in the Bible. It might be. They're all good. Where should we start? All right, let's start at verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all these things that had, taken place, uh, that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with him, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He's been risen from the dead. They don't recognize him. He said to them, what is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? They stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus says to them, what things? This is funny, y'all. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth. So now they're going to tell Jesus about Jesus. He was a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. In other words, we had hoped he was the one who was going to fulfill the word of God. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. If they do not believe Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced if someone rises from the dead. And now the man who's risen from the dead is explaining to these two people, Moses and the prophets. And they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. All right, how Jesus is that, right? They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? That's what I want to happen to us. Week in, week out, year in, year out. I want our hearts to burn within us 
as the Holy Spirit opens to us the Scriptures that the risen Jesus Christ has fulfilled. Can you imagine being able to hear what He explained to them? Is it not of sovereignty that God decided not to record a single word of that Bible study? How that is so providential because we would, we would want it. We would want to see it. And you know what? It's a good thing that we don't know it because God is going to keep us hungry. He has given us what we need. But just to have been there and hear what Jesus had to say, their hearts burning within them. They rose that same hour. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And so as they're talking, Jesus shows up. So let's just get to verse 44. Jesus shows up now back in Jerusalem, has a little something to eat. Verse 44, he says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So I want our hearts to burn within us so that we are absolutely compelled and propelled into the nations to proclaim repentance for the forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. So like, what a fitting way to end, and, and what I just did is I just brought up a conversation, Christ-centered interpretation, that would take like a year's worth of Ember lectures to just even scratch the surface, but that's okay. I right, would take our time with it, but I want you to know that when we are reading Scripture, we have to read it as one book that, yes, has many sections, that has many genres, but it is all centered on the person and the teaching and the work of atonement and redemption of Jesus Christ. And so we have come these four weeks to be equipped in his words so that our hearts would burn within us and so that we would know that we are now better equipped to proclaim in Jesus' name to all nations that there is forgiveness of sins available to those who will repent as fulfillment of God's word. Is that not awesome? And I want you to know, the fact that we've just done this really is powerful. Please know, God is doing powerful things in this church. We have a lot to be excited about. And so let's just simply finish by praying to him and thanking him for this amazing book. God, we love you. And we know that we love you because you first loved us. And you were gracious and good. And you did not leave this world to suffer in its own mess back in Genesis chapter 11 like you could have. You could have washed your hands of it all. But you didn't. It was never your plan to let it go. Lord, you had your plan from eternity past. You always known what you were going to do, what was going to happen according to your perfect and yet unfathomable mysterious, transcendent will. And so you called Abram, and you said, follow me. And you were sending him to be a blessing to the nations. And we have just seen tonight how that is exactly what you're doing, and you were accomplishing it through Jesus Christ. So God, I just ask that our hearts will burn within us a little bit more, having sat around the embers for a few weeks together and that you would send us to the nations and that we would proclaim in Jesus name that there is forgiveness for sins to all who will turn toward him and we pray this in Jesus name amen thank you guys